Thank you, Philip. I like being called young. I have more gray hair than you can see. As Dr. Peterson just showed you, we've had an ongoing increase in cases of NTM infection here at Lankanaw, and after seeing patient after patient walk into our office at all different stages of this infection, we were motivated to try to understand this disease better. So I'd like to start off by sharing two patient examples with you in order to better explain the driving force behind our work here. Both of these are patients that I currently care for in my clinical practice. The first is a 44-year-old woman that presented to me with two to three respiratory infections per year, intermittent episodes of cough and wheezing, and had one sputum sample growing mycobacterium avium complex. As you can see on her CT scan, she has kyphoscoliosis and a very minimal amount of nodular bronchiectasis in the lingula. Due to her minimal radiographic abnormalities and intermittent nature of her symptoms, she and I elected to follow her off of therapy. Of course, doing so makes me uneasy, as I suspect that over the years, it is possible that her disease may very well worsen. On the other hand, treating her at this point does not seem fully warranted. The ideal situation would be to uncover the environmental source of her infection and make the necessary changes in her home and lifestyle to minimize further environmental exposure. The second case is a 68-year-old woman who came with very debilitating chronic cough and fatigue, and as you can see from her CAT scan in 2008, had bronchiectasis with surrounding consolidation in the right middle lobe. She underwent a bronchoscopy, which grew MAC, and we treated her for 24 months with a triple drug regimen. Her symptoms improved. Her CAT scan improved, you can see, in 2010, but then she had a recurrence of her symptoms, probably due to reinfection, uh, although uh, not 100% clear, but most likely. And you can see her CAT scan again worsened in a very similar location. So our motivation for studying NTM infection here at Lankin are, are our patients, both the two that I showed you and the dozens of others that we care for at various stages of disease. Our goals are to achieve better control of disease in our patients, to prevent reinfection after courses of treatment, to prevent worsening of infection in patients who are culture positive with minimal disease, such as the first patient which I showed you, but have proven to clearly be susceptible, and to prevent new infection in susceptible individuals in our community. So our investigations here at Lankanaw have focused on two main areas, host factors and environmental factors. Dr. Peterson alluded to the host factors, and I'm going to be discussing the environmental factors. How are the women contracting this infection, and what can be done to minimize their environmental exposures uh, in susceptible women? In addition to the study of hormone levels, which uh, you heard about, about from Dr. Peterson, in conjunction with Dr. Janet Sawicki from the Institute of Medical Research here, we're also studying alveolar macrophages of women with NTM to try to better understand the local immune function in the lung. In addition, with the help of Rebecca Quate, our research nurse, who pretty much runs this entire program, uh, we're studying the lifestyle habits and clinical characteristics of women with NTM, and we formed a prospective patient database currently numbering 500 patients. So focusing on our study of NTM in patient homes, this work was done in collaboration with Dr. Joe Falkenham from Virginia Tech and Dr. Richard Wallace from the University of Texas at Tyler. And I actually welcome Joe and Richard to interrupt me at any time if you'd like to comment on anything I say. This would have been, as I alluded to in my introduction earlier, impossible to do without working together with them. And I can't emphasize how important this collaboration has been. So this is a title of the abstract, which we'll be presenting next week at the ATS, Municipal Water Supply as a Major Source for Pulmonary Mycobacterium avium Lung Disease, a Comparison of Household and Respiratory Isolates. The rationale was to investigate household water as a potential source for MAC pulmonary infection. The DNA fingerprint of M. avium obtained from household water of female patients with MAC lung disease was compared to that of their respiratory isolates. The cultures were obtained from multiple different household water sources of women with MAC infection from our practice. The respiratory and the water M. avium isolates were identified to species by DNA sequencing by Dr. Falkenham and the strain comparison was performed using PCR-based VNTR uh, by Dr. Richard Wallace. And as far as I know, I think he's one of the only ones in the country who's actually doing this right now uh, for uh, amavium. 
So this is a map showing you the location of uh, our homes in our study. On the top left of the map is the water treatment plant, which supplies water to all of the different homes. And the bottom right is Lankanaw Medical Center. Each blue dot is one of our patient homes. And the Im important thing to note is that every one of these homes derives their water from the same common water treatment plant. And these are our results thus far, and this is a work in progress, so this is not entirely final yet, and the numbers keep changing. Right now, we have uh, 28 patients uh, that we have data on. 20 out of the 28, or 71% of the patient isolates from the respiratory tract were growing M. avium. Four out of 28 were growing M. intracellulare, and interestingly, these were all, all four of these were gardeners. We uh, tested an average of nine sites per home, and in 28% of the homes that we tested, M. avium grew. In 12 out of the 20 patients that grew M. avium, or 60%, there was a matching PCR type between the M. avium in the home and the M. avium which grew from the respiratory tract. And as Dr. Falkenham pointed out earlier, none of the home water samples grew M. intracellulare. And we only knew that because of the VNTR work that uh, Richard Wallace was able to do. So you can see how this collaboration between the three of us was really very important to figure this out. Regarding the household locations of M. avium isolates that matched the patient respiratory isolates, 42% were from the kitchen sink, 42% the bathroom sink, 33% the shower head, and 25% that humidifier on the central heating unit that you heard about. Some of the uh, homes only had a match from the kitchen sink, and some had matches from multiple different locations within the home. There was a remarkable genetic homogeneity between the household and the patient isolates of M. avium. And this was something that was really very exciting. And I don't even think I appreciated how important this was until it was actually explained to me by doctors Falkenham and Wallace what this really meant. But the 74% of the respiratory isolates in between patients of M. avium belonged to the same three VNTR types. They were genetically, I guess, identical, Richard, is that right? 79% of the water isolates of M. avium belong to the same four VNTR types, again, genetically identical between homes. And the most common water VNTR types were also the most common respiratory VNTR types. So to summarize, in 60% of the patients, the genotype of one or more of the household M. avium isolates matched the isolate, from, the isolate from the patient's respiratory tract. And of the matching household isolates, M. avium was isolated from sinks, shower heads, and humidifiers. The majority of the respiratory and water isolates were of the same three to four genotypes. And as you learned earlier, M. intracellulare was not found in water. So in conclusion, uh, from this work, we know that in this homogeneous population of women, all women, most of, uh, all of whom had no known preexisting lung disease, who now have M. avium, an environmental source of infection from their household water supply was determined in 60% of the patients. They may be acquiring their M. avium from sink water, as well as from humidifiers attached to central heating units. And this, uh, you know, part of the aspiration question that uh, Dr. Eisman was discussing that I've always had is, are they drinking water? Is it possible the root of, and I want to discuss this actually, could the root of infection be drinking water, silently aspirating, maybe during sleep, and in particular, thin women, I think, tend to sleep on their sides and on their stomach, which would explain the aspiration into the right middle lobe and lingula, which are anterior segments of the lung. The genetic homogeneity uh, of these isolates suggests the municipal water supply as a source of infection. And then work needs to be done on M. intracellulare, since if they're not acquiring M. intracellulare from water, where is it coming from? And we're going to be doing this study uh, in more depth next with, uh, with uh, Dr. Falkenham and Wallace to try to figure out where is the environmental source of intracellulare, and we're going to be sampling a lot of soil and household dust. Uh, we already discussed hot water heaters a little bit, so I'm not going to go into this too much, except to say that we're also going to be looking into hot water heaters and measuring uh, concentrations of M. avium before and after the water goes into the hot water heater to see if there's a step up in concentration if the hot water heaters truly are serving as an incubator for NTM. So I'd like to leave you with four questions for ongoing consideration. How should we advise patients with NTM disease regarding interventions on their home environment and habits? And I was hoping we could discuss this a little bit today also, because I think this is a question that patients, that a lot of you in the audience have. What should you do differently? Should you change your drinking water? 
your showering, your hot water heater type, your hot water heater temperature is. Do we know enough right now to do this or do you need to wait for more proof? Similarly, how about patients with minimal disease, like the first patient which I presented to you today? Should we be advising them? They've proven they're susceptible. They're not sick yet. They don't even warrant treatment yet. Should they be making uh, lifestyle changes? And what about the general public who fits the classic phenotype of thin postmenopausal white women? Is that too extreme to start initiating ther you know, lifestyle changes in them? We don't understand those susceptibility factors very well yet, so maybe that would you know, cause too much alarm, but something to consider. And very importantly, how can we best work with local water companies and the EPA to address this problem? In conclusion, I would just like to thank again, uh, I think I've done it enough, but I'll do it one more time, Joe Falkenham and Richard Wallace for their generosity in sharing their knowledge and expertise with us and for being such great teammates in this project. I'd like to give a special thank to Rebecca Quait, who hopefully can raise her hand. She really, I, if everybody will join me in giving her a round of applause. Without Rebecca, none of our work here at Lankanol would have been possible. She's tirelessly collected cultures from home, blood samples from patients, and kept us busy clinicians all on track and organized in our studies. I'd like to thank uh, Janet Sawicki, the deputy director of Lemur, the research institute here, and Janet's sitting right back there next to Rebecca. She's been our research mentor in pulmonary. She's guided us and supported us in our work from the very beginning, and her mentorship has been invaluable. And I'd like to thank Don Peterson, who is a true pioneer in the recognition of NTM disease in otherwise healthy women. He first introduced me to this clinical problem six years ago when I first came to Lankanaw. And he's continued to ignite a fire under all of us to continue our quest to understand this problem better. His support and enthusiasm has been inspiring. I'd like to thank all of our wonderful patients, and I speak uh, for, I think, all the clinicians in here. I'd like to thank my colleagues in the Pulmonary and Critical Care Division here for their support and enthusiasm, and the staff at the Microbiology Lab here, Dr. Giger and Cindy Tyson, for all of their help. Our gynecologists helped us to get control patients, Dr. Vaughn and Dr. Nakasbendi, for our blood studies, and the Lankanol Women's Board for their uh, funding support. Thank you very much.